Uh, as we continue this series, we are now in ingredient number five in this series, and uh, we're calling it ingredients, not a formula, not a recipe, because it's not one, one uh, topic that you kind of tackle, you get, uh, you get to expert level, you put it aside, and you move on to the next one. Uh, we're looking at ingredients that ought to be evident in the life of a follower of Jesus for the rest of our days. Like, you, we, we never graduate from any ingredient. These all ought to be at play, and at different seasons in our lives, one ingredient might be more prominent than the other, uh, but they all should be active in our lives for the rest of our days. This is what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. They play off of each other. They work together. Uh, but we are walking through these, these ingredients together. Uh, again, we could probably comb through scriptures and come up with hundreds of ways that our lives ought to look if we're following Jesus. But we're hitting uh, seven primary topics here in the series and uh, we're going to do a very quick review for those of you who weren't with us, or those of you who were with us. This gets your mind going on what the other ingredients are. We'll do this really quick. This is your chance to give some feedback to prove that you have been here, that you've paid attention, or you've got notes that uh, are refreshing your mind right now. But we started all the way back on Easter with ingredient number one. Who could tell me ingredient number one? was received. You cannot be a follower of Jesus without receiving his grace, without receiving his forgiveness, his mercy, his hope, his purpose, that what it means to be a follower of Jesus is you are consistently receiving grace upon grace. It's, it's, it's his grace that brought us to today, and it's his grace that will sustain us, that to be a follower of Jesus, you are constantly receiving his grace on your life. Uh, then we talked, ingredient number two was repent. This section, you guys last week were the best. So far, you're also the best. Uh, hope that riles up the other sections or everyone's just going to start moving over here uh, to be a part of the good section. Uh, it was repent, the good section. That's kind of unfair, uh, but I guess it's out of the bag now. You're my favorite section. Um, Repent is this, uh, it's not this one time like confession. It's not just I'm saying sorry. It's not asking for forgiveness. Those are great, but repentance means that you are turning away from what is sinful and you're turning towards the character of God. Uh, that that it, is, it is making a change for the better. That we, we see areas uh, for improvement or the Holy Spirit's putting on our hearts some conviction to make changes. And so uh, repentance, it's not a one time thing. Repentance is that it's, it's daily. It's saying I'm signing up to be faithful to the fight, that I'm consistently, for the rest of my days, I'm turning away from that which is sinful, and I'm pursuing the holiness and the character of God. So we had receive and repent. Ingredient number three, you guys were good. Uh, remove. Remove, not just repent, but like so often we can find ourselves in uh, this, this cycle where we have seasonal success from turning away from sin, but as soon as the temptation arises again or we're in a moment of weakness, we find ourselves back in the same behavior we used to be in because we didn't actually eliminate that, that area, that temptation, that, that struggle in our lives. So what does it look like to, to burn the plows? Or we talked about removing the impurities from the silver. What's it look like to, to be created more in the image of God by not just repenting of and turning away from, but removing so that we won't go back? Uh, and then we had, so we had receive, we had repent, we had remove, and then last week we talked about number four, which is rebuild. rebuild. Very good. Rebuild is what do you do with the gap? If we removed, now there is space, there is time, there is relationship, there is finances. There, there, what, what do we replace it with? We talked about being intentional about what fills the gap. And although there are so many good practices we could fill the gap with, ultimately what it came down to is that we take off the old self and then we clothe ourselves with the presence of Jesus. That it is pursuing the presence of Jesus. That when you are consistently in his presence, that you become more like him. You begin to be passionate about what he's passionate about. Your purity becomes his purity. Like It, it, it comes down to, are we putting on the presence of Jesus? We're going to jump into uh, ingredient number five today. The first scripture we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll look at a few different scriptures here today, uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15, and this is the Apostle Paul who is writing to the church in Corinth. He's writing to believers, to the church, uh, challenging them in various ways, and look at this statement that he makes here uh, in chapter 4, verse 15. He presents a problem. He says, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Though you've got a lot of spiritual guides you don't have many fathers. He presents a problem that still permeates the church world today. 
that there can be a lot of spiritual people gathering together, but there's not a lot of spiritual moms and dads. That uh, there could be instructors, moral supervisors is actually what this original word meant for guides, like people who are more, have moral standards, have a religious belief system, but they're not actually reproducing this faith in raising other spiritual children. This is uh, still today such a permeating issue within the church, that there are lots of spiritual people, but we lack individuals whose faith is being passed on or reproduced in others. I wanna tell you as we look at ingredient number five today, followers of Jesus are to do a whole lot more than just gather around other followers of Jesus. That ingredient number five that should be evident in the life of a follower of Jesus is reproducing. If you're taking notes, the word is reproduce. That we are not just supposed to uh, receive the grace of Jesus and, and repent and remove and rebuild and like just establish internally what our life looks like and just build this individually. But what God is doing inside of us certainly is for what he's doing for us and the future that he has for us and the purpose he has for us, but it doesn't end with us. That an ingredient that ought to be evident in a life of following Jesus is yes, internal, but it also turns external. That we don't just be a gathering of spiritual people hanging out with other spiritual people and have the tragedy of lots of guides together, but not many spiritual mothers and fathers, that there is a reproducing that is supposed to happen. Um, if you're taking notes, this is a phrase that's going to be prominent in our teaching here today, is that uh, reproduction is a byproduct of intimacy. Reproduction is a byproduct of intimacy. Um, uh, Danny and I, we've got uh, three children, and uh, every time that, that Danny was pregnant and gave birth, there was always this like celebration from other people, always congratulating Danny, like in well deserved. And any woman uh, who who has been pregnant or delivered a child like deserves tons of credit. Like you did amazing, way to go, good job, that's incredible, you're amazing, and uh, it's all true. And I think she deserved all the celebration. But as a dad, maybe some of you experienced. There's also a little bit in there. Is like. You guys know I had something to do with this, right? Like, I just feel like saying that. And it's actually embarrassing because the contribution we gave to this life is very minimal. Uh, but I feel like there's, there's something, some credit it should be given. Like, I had something to do with this. Uh, Danny and I, there's been times over and over in life where we look at our children, regardless of their age. And I don't know how many times I've spoken it to Danny. Like, can you believe this came from us? Which is a true statement, but largely this child came from Danny. Like I had a embarrassing small contribution to the creation of life. Let's be honest. So although it's true that we had a part to play, with well, a contribution that, that, that I largely played was just a moment of intimacy. And we're not gonna get any more crass than that today. Um, but intimacy produced reproduction. But the hard work, the heavy lifting was done, and to be honest, is still done by my wife. I wanna say, as we get to this, this, this topic, this ingredient of spiritual reproduction, I wanna make this very clear, that Jesus, he does the vast majority of the heavy lifting. We are not the savior, we do not create new spiritual life in other people, but we do get to engage with a small contribution to what God is doing in the lives of other people. I want to tell you that the contribution that we get to have, that we get to experience, where it comes from is our individual intimacy with Jesus. That we don't do the rescuing, we don't do the saving, but we get to have opportunities. And many of you have experienced this when you have shared your faith, you have prayed for, you've invested in another life who, who the presence of God begins to change. There's a moment where you look and you recognize, I had something to do with this. Now, it wasn't you who changed anything, but you know that God allowed some level of engagement, of contribution to the work he's doing inside of somebody else. And it's beautiful and it's amazing. And God does the vast majority of the heavy lifting, but allows us a small contribution, and it is birthed in intimacy. If you're taking notes again, reproduction is a byproduct of intimacy. In fact, we get to see the strategy of Jesus played out um, and, and see that what his desire was was not just how many people in his span of 33 years on this earth and three years of public ministry, it wasn't just about how large of a crowd can I get to believe in me today. His strategy was how personally intimate can I get with a handful of people that when my time with them is done, that they're gonna pass on what has happened in their life to other people. And in fact, today we are part of a movement of followers of Jesus that has lasted over 2,000 years and has 
has gathered uh, hundreds of millions of billions of people, uh, maybe not hundreds of billions, I'm not sure that many have existed, but billions of people have become followers of Jesus because of a small handful of people who had an intimate encounter with Jesus and didn't keep it to themselves. Something inside of them, they knew that the, the strategy of Jesus was to receive and to repent and to remove and to rebuild. And an ingredient that was to be evident was that they were reproducing in others. We're going to actually look at the first and last commands Jesus gives his disciples. Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to find the first. This is Jesus calling disciples to himself for the first time. Matthew 4, 18 through 20 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. So we see this like dual first command from Jesus. First thing, the first phrase is, is follow me. Like, leave your old lifestyle behind. This is a call of, of repentance, receiving a call, receiving a future, uh, receiving that Jesus is drawing them unto himself. So we see some of the ingredients evident in the come follow me. Turn away from your old lifestyle. They see that they, they leave their nets behind. There's this pivotal moment where they're no longer going this direction. They're turning and following Jesus. And uh, this doesn't insinuate the fishing is a sin. We're in Montana. I can't say that. You'll never come back. It's not fishing that's the problem. But there is a call for a new direction in their life. And they drop their nets and they begin to follow Jesus. But his, his command from the very beginning wasn't just come follow me, come let me change your life. He says, come follow me. And as you are following me, as this change in your life is happening, I will be making you into something new. And what Jesus intends to make his followers in this phrase is fishers of men, someone who will reach somebody else, that you will reproduce what I'm doing inside of you into somebody else. This was his vision from the beginning. Come follow me. We're going to spend these few years of intimate encounters with each other, and then you're going to pass this on, and then it's going to get passed on again. And generations later, we're going to be here all the way across the world worshiping Jesus together because this was the, the plan from Jesus from the beginning. His first command was that his followers would be of those who reproduce. Too often, though, we, we stop at following. We love that Jesus is loving us, that he's calling us, that he's, he's building us into something greater, something better, yet we never become spiritual mothers and fathers. I want to tell you, we celebrate those that have put their faith in Jesus, and we're never going to stop giving opportunities for people to receive the gospel, to find the hope of Jesus. But, but faith in Jesus is only part of the calling. Yes, we are called to follow him, but we are also called to reproduce in others. Let's fast forward to the end of Jesus' time here on this earth in the flesh. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. If you uh, have been raised in the church, many people know this is the Great Commission, like Jesus' final charge to his followers. And he says this, this is post-resurrection. Some of his last words, he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, uh, I wanted you to follow me, and I wanted to make you into someone that would reach other people. And now that we have spent this time together, there's some maturity, you've encountered my presence, you know my character, now I want you to go and make disciples. Uh, I want to highlight the word disciples because this is not converts. It doesn't say, like, go just tell people and then abandon them and hope for the best. Don't just get up and preach to a bunch of people and hope they figure it out. Like, he, he says, I want you to go make disciples. Uh, those of you who have had the privilege of being parents, you recognize that parenting doesn't end at conception. Parenting doesn't end at birth. Parenting doesn't end when they start walking. Parenting doesn't end when they turn 18. Parenting doesn't end when they go to college. Parenting doesn't end when they're done with college. Like Parenting perpetuates, and certainly there's changes and adjustments in what that parenting looks like, but there is not like a graduation from being a parent and it's over. Like we're called to make disciples. And this insinuates more than just sharing one time what you believe or someone saying, that's amazing. I, I would love to accept Jesus in my life. I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. And then we hope for the best. The making disciples, it's a parenting process of like we're going to be engaged together through the seasons of what it means to grow as a follower of Jesus. 
We're going to look at Acts chapter 1. These are actually the last words that we have recorded out of Jesus' mouth before he ascends back into heaven. It says this in Acts chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 8. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. It's just amazing. Jesus' literal final charge. He says, I'm going to put the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You're going to have a power. I want to tell you that, that Jesus said that this power is not just going to be a power inside of you so that you can live a more moral life. The power is not just for you to be gifted to help the church body, as we've talked about. But he says the power of the Holy Spirit, one of the components, the reasons that he wants us filled with the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit will give you the power to be a witness. And not a power just for yourself, not an internal bettering yourself power, but a power to take what he has done inside of us and share it with somebody else. That we cannot be recipients of the power of the Holy Spirit and just hope it makes us better and our life better. No, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, so that you will share, so that you will reproduce in somebody else the power that I've put inside of you, the, the life that I've given you. So the last command Jesus gives his followers is be filled with my spirit so that you can be a witness. He said, uh, these have been some good years, but don't just have followed me, but the rest of your life, spend your hours, spend your days, spend your years, spend your one precious life reproducing, being a witness, telling other people. I want to highlight the word witness like we did in Disciple in the last verse. This is uh, that we're going to be empowered to be witnesses. Now, a witness is just someone who simply tells the truth about what they experienced, tells the story. Uh, and, and to be honest, we witness about everything all the time. There's not a day that goes by where we don't witness, whether it was about the food that we had or the, the, the funny meme that we saw or it's, it's about the, the movie that we watched or the hike that we went on. Like we're always telling people the experience that we had. What it means to be a witness is you clearly speak the truth about what you have seen or what you have felt or what you have gone through. I want to tell you, we are called to be a witness to simply speak the truth of what we have experienced. If you take this even in, in a legal court setting, a, witness, um, a witness's job is, is not to declare or prove innocence or guilt. A witness's job, uh, they're, they're not the one on trial. They're not the one who has to prove anything or everything. Now, certainly their character impacts their credibility, which is a whole other sermon for another day. Character certainly affects credibility, but a witness, their job is to testify honestly about what they saw, what they felt, what they experienced. It is, it is just a testimony of what they saw. Um, I think that this is so beautiful because in our spiritual lives, this takes a lot of the pressure off. That a witness's job is not to prove innocence or guilt. Although the testimony, they might hope that it sways the jury one way or another. It's not on them. It's not their shoulders to, to prove innocence or guilt. It is their job to just say, this is what I experienced. This is what the truth is. And then it's out of their hands. I want to tell you, that's the beauty of being a witness. Is It's not on your shoulders to save somebody. It's not on your shoulders for them to decide. What it is on our shoulders is to accurately declare what we've experienced, that we are the witness. Now, I want to tell you, being able to communicate, being able to know what you believe and share it, uh, to teach it to somebody else, has great value. But what has higher value, what is more important, is that you have a personal experience with Jesus. Like a witness is not a witness without an experience, without an encounter, without you being there, present with him. That this is not a call to like just intellectually educate yourself on what the Bible teaches or what a church believes. It is first and foremost you having a personal encounter in the presence of God, you experiencing the grace of Jesus, and then learning how to articulate that certainly has great value. But what is most important is that as a witness is that you were there, that you have been in the presence of God, that you have experienced him. Um, what I also love about being a witness or even as we consider the idea of, of reproduction. Reproduction most commonly happens one at a time. Uh, parents, twins sounds crazy, and then you got the Joneses who decide to have triplets. I think they didn't decide, but uh, have triplets. Like, it, it's just wild. 
for the vast majority of the time, reproduction happens one at a time. And I think sometimes when it comes to this like spiritually reproducing, we have this mindset like it has to be with a microphone in front of a bunch of people. I wanna tell you that is, it's not the truth. That it is one at a time is the most common way even spiritually to reproduce that is investing in one person. And so I wanna just uh, encourage those of you who maybe you, you know your spiritual gift or you don't know, but you know that you're uncomfortable in front of groups of people. It's not the way that you witness. Witnessing and reproducing is that you have a relationship with one person and you pray for them and you, you show them the character and the love of Jesus and you are invested even in a single life. That it is not about sharing in front of a group of people. It's loving and praying for and investing in one. I love it when you look at Jesus' life, there's certainly moments where he has crowds of people, where he feeds the 5,000. But there are so many times where Jesus is so intentionally pursuing the one. He actually shares that uh, the heart of God is that uh, it would be leaving the 99 sheep to go chase the one that is wandering. Like it's the heart of God to chase after the one. You can see in Luke chapter eight, there's a demon possessed man and Jesus gets in a boat, travels all the way across the Sea of Galilee, ministers to one, hops back in the boat and heads back. Like it wasn't just looking for the crowds, he was loving the one. You can look at John chapter four, at the woman at the well. He goes and he just shares hope with one person. And then she goes on and shares with her entire village, her entire community. But Jesus, he just says, I'm just gonna invest in one. And knowing the ripple effect that would happen with the one. You can look at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter five. There's a whole crowd of people who are sick and looking for healing. And Jesus shows up and all he does is love and care for and heal the one. And the one begins to witness, begins to testify of what Jesus had done in his life. You see Jesus even in his last breaths on the cross as he is in pain and he's in agony. He's not there preaching to the multitudes, but he says to the one criminal, like he has enough time and passion and energy for one, even at this moment. I want to tell you, and maybe this can uh, help some that feel more and more introverted or that like you, you never want to be in front of people. I want to tell you, it's not about how many people can you speak to. It's can you be faithfully invested in the heart of God for the one. And for some of you, it might be uh, at work, that delivery driver that shows up once a week and you just have three minutes to show the love and the character of God. That it might be someone that you, you live next to or it might, be, it might be someone that you work with or you go to school with. What's it look like to just say, uh, I'm gonna be a witness, I'm gonna testify to the one. And what I love is that Jesus knew the power and the impact. He didn't overlook the individual, but he knew the power of the one witnessing after that experience was over. Like these, these encounters of Jesus, they never stopped with these individuals. And Jesus, it's not like he didn't love this individual, he, that, that he didn't just do it for them, but he also knew the power of an encounter with the presence of God that begins to be testified over and over again, the ripple effect that begins to happen. And that's why we're here today, because it perpetuated throughout time and throughout the, the globe. Uh, I just think that we need to revalue the power of one. The power of you loving one person. I know that oftentimes a, a gift set or a skill set of, of being able to publicly teach seems like, well, that's where it's at. I want to tell you, I'm grateful that God has gifted me in this way and others in this way. And there is power in public teaching. But the power, the real power, was not in how many people can hear one guy talk. It's a body of people who are witnessing to what God has done in their lives that perpetuates way beyond us. One of the, the, the statements that we made even before Anchor Church had a name is we had a vision that we will build a church that outlasts us, that it cannot be built on a couple of people's skill sets because when those skill sets are removed, so goes the church, that we are building a church that outlasts us. I wanna tell you, there can be great power in an individual gift set being able to preach the word of God, but what outlasts for generations and for, the, for, for the thousands of people in the future is not one preacher, but a body who is engaging in loving and investing in one at a time. And when one experiences the presence of God and they begin to testify and others experience the presence of God and they testify, the impact of this community better outlast us. The success of our church is not how many people hear one guy preach. The success of our church is not how many YouTube views we get. The success of our church will be determined long after we're gone. Did we not just get our lives right with God, but did we reproduce? Were we witnesses to what God had done? Like this is a burning vision that God has given us is that we build a healthy church that outlasts us. And there's so much power in one at a time. Last scripture I want you to turn to today is Romans chapter 10. We're gonna start in verse nine. 
says this, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're going to pause there for just a second. This is the beauty of the gospel. That anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jew or Gentile, meaning it's, it's, it's not about your background, it's not about your ethnicity, it's not about uh, the ways that, that you thought and were raised in the past. It's just like anyone and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's believing in your heart. It's not the works that you do. It is just, it, it's the recognition of who Jesus is. It is this believing and declaring that saves us. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Such beautiful news for those of you who have put your faith in Jesus to remember, but also such beautiful news for those who have yet to hear, yet to receive, that we can have the confidence that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But check out verse 14. It says, but how can they, meaning those that haven't yet, people in our lives, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go tell them without being sent? There's this beauty that anyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But there's the potential that they don't know that this is an option for them. That salvation isn't an option for them. So it goes through this series, but where it starts with is believers. People who have already experienced the hope of Jesus, recognizing that they have not just been saved, but they have also been sent. And when you recognize that you have been sent and you begin uh, telling and sharing that it goes down the list again to where anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And they know that because somebody began to share, someone began to testify. So I just want to clarify and commission that if you have put your faith in Jesus, you have been saved and you have been sent. That you are a follower and you are a fisher of men. I love how John 15 says that you have been chosen and you have been appointed. I want to make it clear that these come together. The ingredients of a life of a follower of Jesus is absolutely receiving, but it is also reproducing. That this is to be evident in the life of a follower of Jesus. As we move towards conclusion, I don't know how many minutes that means, so don't, don't look at your watch yet. We're early. I want to move this from just teaching to some challenge, some application. I don't think what we've talked about is too difficult of a concept for followers of Jesus to grasp. However, the statement that we open with from Paul, that there's just not a lot of spiritual mothers and fathers, still rings true. What do you even consider in our own lives? When was the last time that you had a spiritual son or daughter? It's tragic that so many followers of Jesus receive the grace of God and never become spiritual moms or dads. Spend the rest of our days in gatherings like this and life is getting sanctified and purified and like God's doing something in our lives but never have the ingredients of following Jesus. I just want to ponder the question like why don't we? I came up with uh, my own list, and maybe some of it rings true for you. Maybe there's other things, but I think a lot of times we just, our comfort's more important than anything else. Sometimes we just feel like it's uncomfortable to share. Sometimes it's fear of rejection. Like, what if I open up to this and they don't want it, they don't like it, they're not interested? How will this impact our relationship in the future? Like, I'm just going to try to keep being nice, and maybe someday they'll ask me. Like, we just don't want to be rejected. I think sometimes we just feel like, well, it's, it's not my thing. Like, I, it's, it's somebody else's. Like, we'll let the preachers do the preaching. Uh, it's just not my deal. Some people think, well, I'm just, maybe I'm not very good at it. I don't really know how to. I think uh, if we're honest, I feel like everything kind of boils down to, although it sounds harsh, we just don't really care. We just don't care for humanity the way that we would like to believe we do. Imagine with me that uh, you're out on a, a boat, you're on a shipwreck, and now you're stranded at sea. And you can't save yourself. There's no ability to, to, to be your own rescue. You're out there drowning. 
you're going to drown if you don't get rescued. And then imagine a rescue raft comes by. Someone throws a flotation device to you. You're able to grab on. They pull you into safety. And you make it onto the life raft. And you've been saved when you could not save yourself. And now in your possession is that same flotation that was thrown to you to rescue you. And as you're holding on to this flotation, you look out and you see people that you know who are in the same situation you were just in. They cannot rescue themselves. If they don't have someone come to their aid, they, 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 there's no hope. They cannot rescue themselves. Imagine how ridiculous these excuses begin to sound in a setting like this. You know, I'm just kind of comfortable in this boat now. I don't want to like go through the energy of throwing something out to them. Or how silly does it sound to be like, what if they reject it? Like, what if they don't want it? What if they just say, no, I, I, I want a different life raft to, to come save me? Like, it, it begins to kind of fall apart. I mean, how crazy would it sound to be like, I don't know if I'm very good at it. Like, I might not get it all the way to them, so I'm just not going to do it at all. It's just crazy. It would be insane of us in a situation like this to just enjoy our own security, our own safety, our own salvation when we see others who could receive it as well. I want to tell you, we're talking not just drowning. We're talking about eternity here. We're talking about safe, being saved from sin, from judgment, from eternal separation from the presence of God. And our excuses begin to sound pretty petty. I'm afraid that they might reject it. I'm afraid that I might not be very good at it. Like we begin to realize what's really wrong is we just don't have a heart for the lost like we'd like to think we have. I think the hard reality is we love our Christian community. We love our church. We love scripture. We love worshiping, but we don't actually love the people. If we just celebrate every week the rescuing that we got, then all through the week there's people in the same hopeless situation. And we're just glad that we're saved. We're just glad that we're comfortable. I just think that We'd be foolish to feel like we can be a faithful follower of Jesus and never move to a place of reproducing. Never move to a place where we have a burden for somebody else and a passion for them and their future and their eternity is more important than our own comfort. I think um, my next question would be, well, how do we do this? How would I reproduce? If like, yes, this is something I want different in my life. What is our small contribution? Because again, Jesus does the saving. We are not the savior. We get to be a participant in throwing the life preserver, but we are not the life preserver. We are not salvation. But what can we do? What is our small contribution? I would say there's certainly uh, some practicals and I actually started making a list of like, here's some things that we can do. I, I pretty much threw it completely out the window because it, it really boils down to one thing. We individually, passionately follow Jesus. We pursue Jesus because he says, come follow me. And if you are passionately, deliberately, consistently following me, he says, I will make you a fisher of men. Like that's what he is making us to be. And if I am not becoming a fisher of men, I'm not sure I'm following Jesus because either I'm not following him or Jesus lied. I'm going to put my confidence in Jesus doing what he said he would do. That if I follow him, he will make me a fisher of men. So what, what is my job in the equation? My job is to passionately pursue Jesus, to get up every day and say, I'm not just going to stay in this routine. I'm not just going to be a moral person that I'm going to seek you today. I want to know more of you. I want you to transform me. I want to be like you. God, give me your heart for somebody else because I can't create it on my own. I am selfish. I like comfort. I only look to me. If I'm going to be a fisher of men, it's because you're making me more like you. What do you do? You don't like learn a strategy of how to share your faith, although there can be value to that. What you do is you pursue Jesus. We follow him and he begins to make us. I'm convinced that a person intimate with Jesus can't help but reproduce. Reproduction is a byproduct of intimacy and I know this is strong, but if there is lack of spiritual reproduction in your life, I believe it's an indication of a lack of intimacy with Jesus. 
If it's been decades since we shared our faith with somebody and they became a follower of Jesus as well, I, I just question our personal intimacy with Jesus. Because when you are intimate, reproduction begins to happen. You get his heart, you get his passion, you get his love, you start seeing humans, not, not just in, in how they react to you, but you see their eternity, you see the love of God and the purpose he has for them. Like, this is what happens when we get close to Jesus. So it's not like this to-do list of like, go try this out this week. No, it's get to know him. Because when we follow him, he makes us what we cannot make ourselves. I'm a lot more emotional than my run through, I'll tell you that. I wanna tell you this is not about getting better at preaching, it's about pursuing an intimate relationship with Jesus. Ben, I'm gonna ask you guys to come on up. I do wanna give just one simple application because the truth is that there may be questions like, well, I don't know at all what to do. I don't know, we have so many people who are new to faith, so many people uh, who maybe you just don't really know anything practical. I wanna make this really simple, really practical. I would encourage you to invite other people to the places you have, an encounter, you have encountered the presence of God. You know what you can do? You can invite other people to the places where you've experienced the presence of God. And I wanna be very careful and very clear to not make the church the savior, to make Anchor the savior at all. But there's a lot of people that you have experienced the presence of God, and he's been doing a work inside of you. And, and for some of you, he's been using Anchor Church to be a part of that. And if that is true, and we know other people who also need to experience the presence of God, just invite them to those places. And again, that doesn't mean specifically Anchor Church, but what are those places where you experience the presence of God, and how do you invite somebody else into that? And then I do think it's important, it's valuable, and it's why we have groups, and why we're, uh, we're talkers, our discipleship pastors, like how do we also train our body and how to share faith with other people? What does it look like for us to begin loving people? The one, the individual. I was thinking this week, you know what's amazing is that at some point in time, we were all somebody else's one. We're here because Jesus started a movement 2,000 years ago. And we have a whole spiritual lineage that we don't know this side of eternity that has led to us. It didn't stop. There's generation after generation. At some point, someone specifically knew us and loved us. Maybe it was your biological parents. Maybe it was just a friend, a coworker. I don't know your story, but somebody loved and cared for and invited and took a courageous step to share with you, to love you, to invite you. And God forbid it ends with us. What's amazing is uh, you're also sitting next to somebody else's one, either in the past or even right now. Somebody's one they've been praying for, they desperately love. I know when you come to gatherings like this, it can be easy to just get caught up in just what we're here for and a number of people and, and bypass the individual. What's it look like for us to recognize that every single person we interact with today and next week and however long we get to do this together, there's somebody's one. And what God could do when that one experiences his presence and God begins to develop and grow them and the ripple effect from them. I'll challenge you, what it, if you have your one or you have, God gives you one that you just want to love and, and pray for and invest in and invite, I want to challenge you with this thought. How would you want that one treated if they finally showed up to an experience like this? And how do we begin treating everybody that way, because there's somebody's one. Some of you are here today for the first time and there's somebody who's been praying for you, has been loving and inviting. And next week, someone's gonna show up that someone has been praying for. What does it look like for us to recognize, maybe I wasn't the one that had the relationship with them initially, but I'm gonna love and I'm gonna care for and I'm not gonna be here just for myself. 
So it'd be fun to come to gatherings like this and it's exciting to see what God's done in this church in just a year and a half. And, and I, I love this place. But it can be so easy to celebrate what God has done and to enjoy this community so much that we subtly slip into just enjoying our life raft together. My prayer is that God would just stir inside of us a passion, a burden, whatever you want to call it, but more importantly, his heart for people. That we wouldn't just be followers, but we would become fishers of men. That we wouldn't just be consumers enjoying our church gatherings. We'd be so intentional to engage, to love, to care for. If you're willing and able, would you stand with me today? Maybe you're here today and um, you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus. You don't consider yourself a Christian. I don't know what brought you here today. Um, I want to tell you, we firmly believe what Romans 10 says, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone. And maybe, um, maybe today we were sent so that you could call on Jesus. Sent to just testify, to witness, so that you could call on him. I want to tell you, Jesus' message to you is the same. Come follow me. And as you follow me, it will be a progression of making you into something more. That it's not a come follow me and in this moment, uh, I'm going to ask you to do this huge list. No, he's like, just start following me. And as you start following him, he, be, he begins to make you. Maybe today's the day where you figuratively drop the nets and start following Jesus. We want to say we love you. We welcome you to this, this journey of being faithful to learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I want to tell you our heart is not to just share a message and hope you figure it out. Like we want to be a community that is here for discipleship, to, to become lifelong followers of Jesus. If something's been stirring in your heart today or even recently of becoming a follower of Jesus, or maybe you're you've kind of been thinking about this for a while. Um, here's something you can do to help us uh, be here for you. There's a, on the QR code, there's actually physical copies uh, as well. But we have this, these little cards that say, I've decided. If you pull up the QR code and you just say, I've decided. And there's a checkbox to say that I've decided to start following Jesus. And you can put whatever information you want or don't want. But that's, um, it's not filling out that card that, that gets you saved. It is your faith in Jesus. But it's what's really helpful for us as a community to come alongside of you and not just hope you figure it out, but what does it mean to grow in a life following Jesus? We'd love it if you would take a moment to fill that out today. Again, you can do that on the QR code or you can do it on our website and there's also hard copies on your way out. But if you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus, I wanna challenge you, specifically those who um, never have or it's been quite some time since you've had a spiritual child. My heart and my prayer is that God just puts a burning desire inside of us. And I think um, a call to reproduce starts with your intimacy with Jesus. I think the call today is, what's it look like to go all the way back? So Jesus, I just need to, I just want to be closer to you. I want your heart. Would you give me your vision? Why don't you give me your passions? I just want to be more like you, Jesus. And we become like him by being with him. The band's gonna lead us in a song in just a moment. And my request is that we don't just make this a, a song to sing. But what's it look like for us to take these moments and say, Jesus, I just wanna be more like you. I, I need your heart. I repent. I wanna turn away from just having my own spiritual comfort. Acknowledge that I've neglected the, the ingredient of reproducing. What's it look like? This is a call of just being intimate with Jesus. Jesus, we love you. We just ask right now in this moment, these last couple minutes we have together in this room, together we would have a moment of being more intimate with you than we've experienced in a while. It's not just to be challenged by a message, 
But right now, your, your spirit is here and you've been challenging us over these last several minutes. And right now, we just want to respond by pursuing your presence, by being intimate with you. Lord, would you change us? We thank you that you have, saved, you have saved us, but you have also sent us. And Lord, we just ask right now that you would just, in your presence, build us. Holy Spirit, that you would put your power inside of us to be a witness. It's not our power. It's not our strategy. We need the power of your Holy Spirit right now. So Spirit, would you just fill us? Even to those who don't even really maybe have an understanding of what that might mean. We just ask right now, we just believe that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, would you be the empowerment inside of us to be who you've called us to be?